Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I wanna take a look at the fed state, also known as the absorptive state, which is what's happening metabolically after we've eaten a meal. So first thing I wanna talk about is the fact that the fed state is characterized by high blood glucose levels and subsequently high insulin levels. And the whole point of it is to bring the blood glucose levels back down. And it tells the body to do a couple of really important things. So we've just eaten a meal and that meal is gonna contain proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, which are our macronutrients. They end up getting broken down through our digestive system, predominantly in the mouth, stomach, and first part of the small intestines, known as the duodenum, into glucose, primarily, fatty acids, glycerol, and amino acids. Now, the fatty acids and glycerol, which were fats, triglycerides, actually get absorbed into our lymphatic system. So we'll talk about that lastly. Firstly, I wanna talk about glucose, and then we'll look at amino acids. So if we have a look at glucose first of all, we've got glucose that's been absorbed from our duodenum, or our small intestines, into our bloodstream. All right, now, blood glucose levels are gonna be high now. Now, if blood glucose levels are high, and it's floating through the bloodstream, it's ultimately gonna to go to the pancreas and trigger a certain type of cell in the pancreas, known as a beta cell, to release insulin. And what insulin does is something really important. Insulin decreases blood glucose levels by telling certain tissues of the body to open up their transport membranes and let glucose in, that's the first thing. Second thing is insulin inhibits certain functions or metabolic functions of the body like lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fats to produce energy, and proteolysis or proteolysis, which is the breakdown of proteins ultimately to produce energy. It inhibits this. The reason why is because insulin is here to primarily promote storage. So we've just eaten, we wanna store all of these micronutrients and maybe use a little bit for energy once it's inside the cell because we want to drop this blood glucose level down. So insulin's being released. Now there's certain tissues of the body that are insulin dependent. They need insulin to let glucose in. These tissues include muscle and fat. But tissues like the liver, for example, and the brain and the kidneys and red blood cells and the intestines, they do not require insulin in order to get glucose into their cells. They're, gluco or they're insulin independent. And that's important because when our blood glucose levels are high and insulin's released, our brain's always gonna take that glucose in. Our liver's always gonna take that glucose in, but our muscle and our fat will not. So blood glucose levels have gone up, insulin's been released. This high glucose level, let's look first at what's happening at the liver. Glucose, like I said, will always enter the liver. And once that glucose is in the liver, it can do a couple of things. Primarily, it's going to be stored. And glucose is mainly stored in the form of glycogen. Now remember, if in biology you see a word that ends in O-G-E-N, it means stored and inactive. Glycogen is the stored form of glucose. I like to think about glucose as Lego blocks. Glycogen, when you click all those Lego blocks together, that's how it's stored. This is how most of our glucose is stored in the fed state. Some of this glucose, a little bit less than 10% of it, may turn through a process of glycolysis, going from glucose ultimately into something called pyruvate, and pyruvate ultimately into something called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA enters something called the Krebs cycle, and in the Krebs cycle, it spits out some ATP. So spits out some energy, really important. Another important point here, however, is the fact that acetyl-CoA can also produce fatty acids. And the process of glycolysis going from glucose to pyruvate, if we need to, it can produce glycerol. And if we bring fatty acids and glycerol together, what do we get? Triacylglycerides. So, triacylglycerides, but we can also get, so we can get triglycerides, which is the stored form of fat, and we can also get very low density 
lipoproteins. Very low density lipoproteins have lots of fatty acids and glycerol, can travel throughout the body and deliver these substances to the adipose tissue, to the muscle tissue, to different tissues of the body. All right, another thing that can happen is, that's glucose, amino acids that we've got can be absorbed in the liver as well, and they can actually just enter the Krebs cycle, this cycle that produces the ATP from acetyl-CoA. All right, what happens to glucose at the muscle tissue? Well, remember, muscle tissue needs insulin. So we've got to write insulin up here because it won't let that glucose in without the insulin. But now the insulin's here. So let's get that glucose in. And similar to what's happening in the liver, glucose can be stored as glycogen. Otherwise, that glucose can undergo glycolysis turn into pyruvate, go from pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and that acetyl-CoA can undergo the Krebs cycle again and produce some ATP. The amino acids that are coming in for muscle tissue are predominantly going to be stored as proteins. So you've got protein storage at muscle, glycogen storage at muscle as well. In the liver, you're going to have glucose storage as glycogen, fat storage as well, and amino acids jumping into the acetyl-CoA system. What's happening at adipose tissue? Well, glucose can enter adipose tissue as well. It's insulin dependent, so we need to put insulin here again, like we did for muscle. And then once the glucose enters the adipose tissue, glucose will not be stored as glycogen. What glucose will do is undergo glycolysis, pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, undergo the Krebs cycle, and what's gonna happen is that it can spit out some ATP, if need be, but we'll also spit out, let's go this way, glycerol and acetyl-CoA, again, can turn into fatty acids. We can store those two as triglycerides. But also from the meal that we've eaten, the fatty acids, so We've eaten that meal, the fatty acids and glycerol got absorbed into the lymphatic system, not the bloodstream, right? Not the portal vein, which most of these do, right? Glucose and amino acids, for example. But what happens is fatty acids and glycerol into the portal vein get put together into something called a chylomicron. Fatty acids, glycerol into something called a chylomicron and that chylomicron can deliver fatty acids and glycerol to the adipose tissue which again can be stored as triglycerides okay and so what we've got here is a run through of what's happening in the fed state it's all mediated by this insulin and mediated by high nutrient levels predominantly high glucose levels but also high levels of amino acids and high levels of broken down triglycerides in the form of fatty acids and glycerol